Good morning. Welcome to Charleston Calvary. It is absolutely a beautiful day. Hey man, hasn't the weather just been wonderful? Oh my. Well, we are glad you're here. By way of announcements, if you want to take a quick look in the back area, the ceiling tile is up and it looks beautiful and they're still working. Uh, they got some uh, uh, permits this past week all taken care of, so more things are taking place. If you want to take a look at that, you'll see where your investments are going. Amen? And then also, uh, we want to remind you to continue to be faithful in your giving to the uh, uh, tithes and offerings of the church. The giving box, of course, is available to you. Uh, many of you I know give uh, to, through Easy Tithe. And whatever means you use, uh, I just want to tell you that we really do appreciate it. We really do. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to pray for the service, but we're also going to pray for a couple of our members that uh, are in need of prayer. I heard earlier this week that Brenda Lupton had to be put into the hospital. So pray for Miss Brenda and pray for James. And also, um, we want to pray for Patty Buckwalter. She has another surgical procedure tomorrow. And uh, pray for Patty. And um, of course, continue to pray for all of those who are affected by the COVID virus. And uh, we, uh, we know that uh, many people are starting to receive their vaccinations. And we thank God for that. And so uh, lots of things, lots of people to pray about. Amen. But this is the day that the Lord's made, and we're going to rejoice in it. And so I'm going to ask you now if you will join me and let's bow our hearts in prayer. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, in your presence we come to worship. To worship the God who is above all gods. We come, Lord, to praise your name. And so we ask that as Brother Steve and the praise team and the praise band lead us in worship, that you would help us to lift our voices up in adoration and praise to you for the wonderful things that you have done for us. But not only that, but that we might praise you for who you are, the God who loves us, and provided so much for us. We also pray this morning that you would be with those who are confined to their homes because of the COVID virus, those that are suffering through it. We pray, Lord, that you would be with uh, those who uh, are receiving uh, their vaccinations, that all would go well for them. Uh, we do pray, Lord, that you would be with uh, my father this morning who is hospitalized this week with pneumonia. Touch him, we pray. We pray that you'd touch Miss Brenda, be with her, be with Brother James. Encourage them, Lord, we pray. We ask that you'd be with Patty. We thank you, Lord, for her first procedure that was done and the recovery that she's made. It's been remarkable. Now she faces another procedure tomorrow. We ask that you would lay your hand upon her and that her recovery would be quick and that the surgeon would, would do exactly what needs to be done for her health and her well-being. We ask, Lord, that you would take and that you would be with our children's pastor this morning, Pastor Karen, as she leads our children be with Pastor Matthias as he leads the Charleston Portuguese congregation. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would be with all the aspects of ministry that are taking place in our facility today. And throughout the week, we just pray, Lord, that as we come to you, that um, we come with um, hearts that are ready to receive, hearts that are ready to respond. And we do so in worship today. And we ask all these things in your holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Please stand with us as we worship this morning. Worship right along.
are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sore, still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, have trumpet calls to lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of science here salvation comes. And these are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as white in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, Shining like the sun, at trumpet calls to lift your voice. This year of jubilee, and out of science to salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes. Riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, and I jump and call, so lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation come. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of science here salvation comes. Lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of science here salvation comes. Amen. Praise God. Breath and I take 
moment I take, every moment I wait, Lord, have your way in me. It's tell me this is you, Senhor. Te adorar Tudo que há em mim Te dou a Só a Ti adoro Meu Senhor I give you my soul I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I wake Lord, have your way in me Lord, I give you my heart I give you my soul moment I wait, Lord, have your way in me. Toma o meu coração e toda a minha alma, eu vivo só pra ti, sempre que eu respirar. Cada vez que eu acordar, faz o teu querer em mim. Essa é o meu no matter where I am, no matter what situation I may in, be involved in, no matter my sickness, my disease, my infirmity, even in a pandemic, He knows my name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Sing this song with us.
that second verse one more time I have a father he calls me his own amen the word says we're the apple of his eye and Jesus said I'll never leave you I'll never forsake you no matter where I go he's still my father and he's still with me let's sing that second verse again I have a father he calls me his own. Yes. You never leave me, no matter where I go. He knows my name. Heavenly Father, amen. Amen. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. How comforting it is for us, Lord, to know that you know us by name. You know what we go through. The struggles of our lives, the difficulties that we face, the people that we pray for. You know each one of us intimately. And so, Lord, we come to you today. We're glad that you can call each one by name. We think of Glenn and ask that you would touch him in the midst of cancer treatments. Be with Brenda this morning and Brother James, who's here today. We ask that you would remember my father, Raleigh. I ask, Lord, that you would be with Gwen, that you would touch her body and strengthen her. Thank you for being with Mary Lou, and, and we just give you thanks for how that you've been with our people. We pray for Steve and for Patty as she faces her surgery. Lord, each one of us have names. The Bible says that even the very hairs of our head are known by you. And if you took care of the little sparrows, so you will take care of each one of us. And so today, probably the most reassuring thing that we will hear today is that you know us by name. You know our lives. And I pray that you would be with each one of us here today, that we would receive comfort by way of your spirit in knowing that you know us by name. 
We ask it in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, I, uh, I don't know if this is the uh, best way to start out a sermon talking about fearing God, but we're looking into the Gospel of Luke in just a minute. I had a conversation with my father a while back. We were talking about the COVID pandemic, and he asked this question of me because I'm the um, pastor in the family. I'm the theologian of the family. And he said, why aren't we hearing about more people turning to the Lord in these days? I want you to think about that question. That's a good question. I remember after 9-11, somebody asked me, they said, well, did your church have a change in attendance? No. Even despite the fact that several thousand people had their lives taken from them and America was forever changed in the process, as a pastor, I didn't notice anything different. So even in the midst of COVID, my dad and I, we talked about people, they say they pray and they're afraid and so forth, but, uh, but no one is getting saved. No one's turning to God. That's what my dad said. So I thought about that and I remember asking my dad about his salvation and my dad and my mother came to the Lord on July 15, 1962. I was six years old at the time, and I remember it as though it happened yesterday. See, my dad worked with a couple of guys at his place of employment there in the east of Monroe. One man's name was Odell Pierce. His brother, Troy, was my Sunday school teacher for many, many years. Cook McKeon was another man that my dad worked with. They told about uh, how that down at the Clark Street Baptist Church, in the east end of Monroe, they'd called a new pastor by the name of Brother Spires, and Brother Spires played a guitar, and his wife sang, as did their daughter, who was a teenager at the time. And my dad came home and told my mom, he says, I think I want to go hear them. And my mom's response was, Really? Because my dad never darkened the door of a church. In fact, he used to shake his fist at Mr. McKeon when he would motion for my dad to come in. One day at work, my dad said, you keep after me. He says, I'm going to take that knick tie you wear and I'm going to squeeze it up till your head pops off. My dad was that ornery. He just didn't go to church. He said he went to church as a kid, but it was always to stand outside the church or the tabernacle and talk to the girls. He said, that's a good spiritual thing to do. But anyway, that night, the Spires sang an old song called Walking My Lord Up Calvary's Hill. And my dad imagined in his mind that Jesus was dying on that cross just for him. And he fell under a great sense of conviction, and both my parents went to the altar that night, gave their hearts to the Lord, and that was on Sunday, July 15, 1962. Now I want to tell you something that happened that night. There was a radical change. You see, nowadays we don't really believe in these radical changes. When I say a radical change, I mean everything in our house changed overnight. All the stuff of the world was gone. Now today, we're not supposed to talk about those negative things, the things of the world like cigarettes and tobacco and swearing, cussing, beer, alcohol. But I want to tell you, overnight, all of that garbage of the world was gone out of our house. The Lord came in our home that night when he cleaned up the heart of my mom and dad and he cleaned up our house. Amen. Amen. A radical change. So my dad's question, why don't we see or hear of people being saved anymore? 
And I had to think about that, and I had to pray about it, and I asked the Lord, give me some sort of a scripture. And so you're getting the scripture that came that day. Because I wondered too, why aren't people coming to the Lord? Why aren't they afraid of God? Why aren't they fearful of eternity? And so I want to give you a refresher course this morning on a couple of things that we do believe about God and that we do believe about being saved and that we do believe about eternity. So stay with me if you will. I've got lots of people who are dying from COVID. I looked this morning, verified the fact that uh, in 2019, about 2.7 million people died average deaths in America. In 2020, that number had jumped 375,000. So it is accurate when we hear about people who are dying from the COVID virus. It's a fact, but those numbers are going to go down. Amen? Amen. I'm glad I wasn't one of them. But there are people whose families suffered one or several deaths because of COVID. So I asked, what does Jesus have to say about something like this? And this is what I came up with. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, there are thousands of people coming to hear Jesus. The Bible says that they were crammed together. They were hard-pressed together, thousands of them, to hear what Jesus had to say. And so Jesus addresses his own disciples and he doesn't tell this to the crowd. He tells it to his close friends. He warns them about being hypocrites like the Pharisees. He says there someday they are going to be exposed and God will punish them for what they have done. As does God punish everyone for what they've done. But this is what Jesus says. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. And after that, they can do no more. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about as a primer, we're, we're looking at, Jesus is trying to teach us something about what we would call, I would call, a holy fear of God. Oh, well, I don't want anybody, I don't want my children or my teenagers to be afraid of God. Well, let me, let me delve a little bit deeper. Having a holy fear of God doesn't mean that you cower in the presence of God. It means that what you do is you develop a fear of God from your love of God. I'll tell you what, I was fearful of my dad. Occasionally fearful of my mother. But I had a respect and a love for them. Amen? Amen. So what we have to do is we have to act and we have to live from both this love and this fear of God. And that's exactly what the Jewish rabbis used to teach in Jesus' day. Love and respect of God. So Jesus says, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. And Jesus is actually kind of alluding to the fact that ultimately he is going to be persecuted and he is going to be put to death. In context, he's talking to his disciples, and they too are going to be persecuted, and they too will face death, with the exception of only one. And even then, they tried to kill him, but they couldn't do it. So Luke 11, the previous chapter, reminds us that even though thousands of people are coming to hear Jesus, he is sensing and feeling a sense of opposition to him, and there is a growing sense of anxiety over his upcoming crucifixion. And so what Jesus is trying to tell his friends, his disciples, let's remember, he's not talking to the thousands, he's talking to his friends, his disciples. And he is saying, I want you to have peace in the midst of, of persecution. One thing is for sure about the Christian church, there have been countless thousands 
that have been persecuted in the past for their Christian faith. There are currently thousands upon thousands of Christians in the world at this very moment that are being persecuted for being able to do what you're sitting here enjoying right now. I'm not so sure if we're going to get out scot-free. We may face a time of persecution. All you have to look is look at the signs, folks. We may be persecuted too. So this is a sermon that is a reminder. It's a response to my dad's question, but I want to use it as a reminder that you and I face the same thing if we are the friends of Jesus Christ. He tells us that. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. Because after killing the body, they can do no more. There's nothing else that they can do. Persecutors can and have killed the body. That's the answer to everything. Read the book of Acts. The first thing they wanted to do is the answer to all things with the apostles and the disciples of Jesus in the New Testament church was, Rob, say it with me. Kill them. Kill them. And they did. They tried. But God has power over life and death. I want you to say that with me. God has power over life and death. Amen? So, there are many things that threaten us and can create fear in our lives to lose our life. I've been in some very fearful situations before. I don't like those situations. Some of you have served in military service and you know what it's like. And those who have served on the police force or the fire department, you put your lives on the line. You put yourself in fearful situations. And what we need to understand is you and I need to be possessed with a spirit of a holy fear of God rather than to be obsessed with fears over our temporal body. I think, and I don't want to guilt anybody, but I think that the reason why, even though we have plenty of room to social distance, there are people who are staying out of church because they're very, very concerned, maybe to the point of obsession, over the temporal body. And none of you said amen, and I don't want you to say amen. That's an observation from me. I'm not trying to guilt anybody. If you're at home this morning, I don't want you to say and contact me, oh, pastor, uh, this is the reason why that I'm not there, or we're not there, or whatever. I'm just saying we need to be possessed with a holy fear of God rather than being obsessed with what can happen to this temporal body. Commentator Adam Clark said, a man has but one life to lose and one soul to save. It is madness to sacrifice the salvation of the soul to the preservation of the body. I want that to soak in. He wrote that probably a couple hundred years ago. But it's true. We can get caught up in so much of what's going on in the world and the fear that the world is trying to impose on us that we forget that we have a never-dying soul to save. Well, Jesus goes on in our text to say, Fear Him. Who? God. Fear God who after he has killed this body 
let it cease from existing, also has the power to cast us into hell. So when somebody tells you that hell is not a reality, I'm sorry, but Jesus says that it is. So if you want to argue, take it up with him. But Jesus says that God has the ability, he has the power over life and death, and God has the ability to take our lives from us And also, God has the power to make the judgment call at the end of our journey. Amen? Man's power is only limited to this human flesh, those that can kill the body, and how true that is. But when we talk about God's power, we understand that persecution, sickness, pandemic can all destroy our life here, but it cannot destroy our soul. Did you hear me say that? It, lots of stuff can happen to this body and we can die over it and I want to let you in on a little secret. None of us are getting out of this world alive. I haven't known anybody to get out of this world alive except Jesus Christ. Even Brother Lazarus was brought back to life a second time, and eventually he died again. We're not going to get out of this thing alive. So we want to be ready for eternity, amen? We want to take care of our soul. Amen? Because God judges our eternal being, our human soul, and thus we fear God. We have a respect of God rather than being afraid of what we are hearing in our world today. Rather than fearing men. Fear God is what Jesus is saying. Because the body is only a temporal thing. If you haven't noticed as you age, things don't work like they used to. Hair falls out, eyes grow dim, muscles kind of get kind of flabby. Now when you're in your 20s or your 30s, you think it will never happen to me. <clears throat> but it does. And see, while our body is temporal, there is an aspect of every human ever born. And this is part of the Imago, Imago Dei. We have an eternal soul. Amen? So, God's power can resurrect us to eternal life. And we're going to celebrate that in about a month with Resurrection Sunday. Amen? Amen. Because He lives, we shall live also. Amen? Understand what Jesus said about eternal death, and that is the losing of our soul. And so there are times when pastors such as myself need to remind congregations such as yourself and everyone that's listening, we are facing eternity. And the soul needs to be taken care of, more so than the body. And we do an awful lot of good things to take care of our bodies. I take a handful of meds and vitamins every day all for the sole purpose of living just a little while longer. But in the process, I want to take care of my soul. Amen. Amen? So Jesus says, yes, I say unto you, fear God. 
And he's talking to his friends. Jesus is actually saying, yes, I want to tell you who you really should fear. And if you're going to fear anybody, don't fear what's down the road that has not happened yet as far as persecution is concerned, as far as your personal death may be concerned, as far as your health may be concerned, I want you to understand, you must fear God, first and foremost. So I go back to my dad's question, because I've got to try to give an answer to my dad as to why. And I said, well, Dad, there are fewer conversions, fewer people being saved today because we don't believe in sin. What? I said, well, Dad, look around your world. Everybody chooses who and what they want to be. It doesn't matter what God says in His Holy Word. Hello? You don't want to be a certain gender? You can change. And nobody's supposed to say anything about it. You want to be a certain this, that, or the other? Nobody's supposed to say anything about it. That's the world that we're living in. And let me just remind you, it's not true. Because God has something to say about all this stuff. Amen? So, everybody goes around, we're not sinners, we're all, say it, we're all okay. I'm okay, you're okay. So I told my dad, I said, well, the reason why people aren't turning from their sin is because nobody sins. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. How true that is. There are no sinners because there is no such thing as sin anymore. Now, I don't want you to leave and say, well, Pastor Lindsay says this and that and the other. He doesn't believe in it. Well, no, I'm just using this as an example. Say amen. amen. So, the next point is, if then there are no sinners, then we do not need a Savior. That's just logical thinking. If you haven't sinned, you don't need to be saved from sin. And so Jesus Christ and his death are all irre irrelevant to us. Am I making sense? In other words, Jesus didn't need to die because there's no such thing as sin anymore, because we're all okay, and God's going to take us all up to heaven in the group rate. The problem is, they haven't read Holy Scripture. You see, we live in a thing called cancel culture. If you don't like something, you tear it down. If you don't like history, you rewrite it. Oh no, you erase it. If you don't like the way that you're living, you justify what you're doing, and you say that God doesn't know what he's talking about. Are you still with me? You see, we don't believe that we need to listen to Jesus because he really doesn't mean what he's saying anyway. And what does Jesus have to say about anything such as sin and fear and judgment and heaven and hell and even God his Father? Why listen to Jesus about anything? Oh, we like the part about heaven. But you can scrap just about everything else that Jesus said. That is cancel culture, and it's affecting the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, fear God more than mankind. Fear God more than the society that you're living in. And let me tell you something about society. I never thought it would get this way. Did you? What we need to do, though, is on a 
regular basis, we need to continue to have that holy fear of God and a very re relational judge, uh, relational love with God. Have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, because ultimately God is the one who gives us eternal life or can condemn us to eternal death. Ultimately, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid of everything that's going on right now. Don't be afraid of the Pharisees. Don't be afraid of the crowds. Don't be afraid that we are going to be facing punishment and possible death, and they did. Jesus is saying what you need to do is you need to make sure that you have this holy fear and this awesome respect of God and have a relationship with him. I like what uh, Oswald Chambers wrote. He said, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. All you have to do is, well, not many of us read a newspaper anymore. Watch the news, listen to the news, read the news on your electronic device, and you'll find one thing that is fueling the flames of all of this tension in our society. I believe it's fear. And it's not because they're fearing a holy God. They are fearing that they don't have a relationship with God. You and I, we are people who live and work, purchase, sell, play sports, with so many people who are living in the depths of despair and fear. And we have the answer. Fear God. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Jesus said this is the greatest commandment. Love God. And when you love God and you fear God, there won't be any need to fear anything else. Amen? So, Jesus, you really want to know who you should fear? Say it with me. Fear God. Let's pray. Lord, there is indeed a great sense of fear when we think about eternal things when we think about a place called hell hell was not part of your creation hell was made after that and hell is real because the bible tells us that it is Hell is real because Jesus told us that it is. And each one of us have a never-dying soul to save and fit it, as the songwriter said, fit it for the sky, heaven. And we love to talk about that place that you've prepared. And that's where our hope is today. But still, Lord, you call us to have a deep, lasting respect for you as our Heavenly Father, for Jesus as your only Son, and for the blessed Holy Spirit who leads us into truth. And so I pray today that you would use this message today as a reminder that while we can live in fearful times, we do not have to be afraid for what people can do to our soul. So help us to develop a strong, lasting relationship with you 
through your Son, Jesus, and through the Holy Scriptures, and by way of your Holy Spirit. So watch over us, we pray, and help us to live the way that you have called us to live in this present world. We ask these things in your holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go in the name of the Lord.